back to Books and Ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and today my guest is Ryder Carroll, author of The Bullet Journal Method, Track the Past, Order the Present, Design the Future. Before I tell you about today's episode, I want to remind you that you will find complete show notes and additional episodes at booksandideas.com. You can send me feedback at docartemis at gmail.com, and you can post audio feedback via SpeakPipe, either the app or the website, speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis. Don't forget to subscribe to Books and Ideas in your favorite podcasting app. All the episodes are free. I launched Books and Ideas back in 2006 because I wanted to have a show where I could go beyond my brain science podcast and discuss a wide variety of subjects. Over the years, I've interviewed scientists, historians, fiction writers, and many others. But I think it's fair to say that I've avoided the self-help genre. So you may wonder why I decided to make an exception this month. The main reason is that I'm intrigued by the potential of the bullet journal method. I especially like the fact that it acknowledges the advantages of physically writing things down. During our conversation, we discuss how this method differs from traditional journaling, but bullet journaling does share several of the advantages of its predecessors. The physical act of writing on paper can stimulate your imagination That's probably why there are still so many successful authors who write their first drafts longhand. But there's something else that Ryder emphasizes in his book. Writing things down on paper slows us down. It gives us a way to practice being in the present moment. This is something that seems to become more challenging every day. So whether or not you decide to give bullet journaling a try, I hope this interview will give you some interesting ideas to think about and explore. Welcome to Books and Ideas and my guest, Ryder Carroll. It's great to have you on the show, Ryder. Thanks for having me. So before we start, I need to tell you one thing, and that is that I've been doing this show since 2006, and my usual guests are scientists and historians and sometimes science fiction authors, and I usually avoid anything that would be considered self-help. So yours is a very different interview for me, and the only reason I'm telling you this is because in case there's some negative feedback to the episode, I don't want you to take it personally. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> noted okay i mean the reason that i decided to feature your book was because i actually read it and i've been trying to do this bullet journaling thing so i usually start out by asking my guests to share a little bit about themselves and in your case your story leads almost directly into the story of your book the bullet journal method yeah so i have been a digital product designer for the past decade, specifically a user experience designer, which means that I design interfaces for platforms ranging from watches to web browsers and so forth. Over the years, I've developed a way of keeping myself organized and focused using nothing more than a, a notebook and a pen, which is a, simply a collection of solutions that I've evolved over I don't know, starting from when I was very, very young. It's always been a tool for me. And at some point, I started sharing it with friends. And their feedback was very encouraging. And then at one point, I decided to share the system publicly, which has been come to be known as the bullet journal method. I shared bulletjournal.com about five years ago. And in that time, it's taken on a life of its own, I guess one could say. And um, the more I worked on it, the more meaningful it became to me. And I've been growing a global community that has been focusing on developing the bullet journal method across very many different types of use cases, something that I hadn't expected when I first released the system. And then eventually I started getting a lot of questions that regard things that sit a little bit outside of what I shared originally, specifically to things that 
pertain to realms outside of productivity specifically, as opposed to how do you set a good goal? It's what is a meaningful goal? And these are things that I've been really interested in for as long as I can remember. Eventually, I thought it would be much more effective for me to share my own insight into these types of questions through a book rather than emailing people individually, because the questions would always be of the same nature. And that's basically what led me to write the bullet journal method, which on the one hand covers very much the productivity aspect of my methodology, but also delves significantly more into the mindfulness aspect. And I'm hoping that we can actually cover a little bit about both of those aspects. Why do you consider the bullet journal method to be something that almost anyone can use? Well, I guess on a very practical level, all you need is a notebook and a pen, and you can choose any notebook you like. It very much leans on concepts that people are already familiar with, journaling, note-taking, bulleted lists. The thing that sets it apart, though, is that it's designed as a foundation, right? As opposed to like a regular planner that's very specific, that has dates and a lot of templates. The bullet journal is designed to encourage people to figure out what tools they need. I like to describe the bullet journal sort of as an empty house. I've given people this house, this foundation, and they need to fill it with their own lives that it can become much more effective. The thing about like a lot of productivity apps is that you have to learn how to use them, right? You have to learn how to think like the authors have thought. They have a point of view and sometimes that point of view aligns with you and sometimes it doesn't or more specifically with your needs. The bullet journal is there to help people design their own tools now, but also allow them to evolve those tools as time goes on, as their circumstances and as their needs change. So it encourages to form a habit of introspection, but also of critical thinking. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What could I be doing more of? What could I be doing less of? And you're doing this on a daily, monthly and yearly basis. In that process, essentially, it can become whatever you need it to be. And Figuring out what you need it to be is part of the practice. So the short answer is anybody can do this because all you need to know is how to write and you need a little bit of time and that's it. So talk about the advantages of writing things down by hand because that's an important theme that runs really, I think, throughout the book. Yeah, there there are many. Um, I would say, and especially now as analog and specifically journaling is having a resurgence, there is a lot of science that's been coming up that also has validated this practice in many ways. The things that speak to me the most are that uh, uh, it engages our mind in a different way than typing, right? Where typing is so fast that it can become rote. You can actually mimic exactly what the source is telling you. When you're writing, it's slower, So it forces your mind to slow down and really pinpoint what is most essential, what is most valuable a lot of the time. In that process, it encourages us to think in a different way, right? You have to reduce this information and you have to distill it in order to focus on exactly what it is that matters. And that takes time and it takes practice, but you are thinking on an ongoing basis as you're recording. And what the science has shown is that it allows us to retain information longer and allows us to establish connections and patterns that we may not have seen otherwise. And it keeps our minds sharper for longer, somewhat in the same way that reading does. So I think writing by hand on a very technical level helps us engage with both our mind and our body in a different way that has proven to have many different benefits on various levels of education. For example, these studies have been done both in kindergarten, elementary school and in collegiate level where the the groups of students were separated into ones that would have to write by hand or they would have to take notes by a typing. And from the studies that I read, generally speaking, most of the students would fare better during an exam or a test or when they were tested on material if they had written their notes by hand and they would retain it a lot longer after the fact. 
Now, another benefit that I feel is that it's also a mechanism that allows us to go offline. Right? When you're writing by hand, you aren't engaging with a device. And I think that's a very powerful feature, not a bug, if you will, of journaling, because all of a sudden you become less distracted just by the nature of writing by hand. When you're in front of your notebook, there's no pings, no messages, no notifications. Ideally, your phone is far away. And that um, allows us to think more clearly. Yeah, well, I'm a lot older than you. So, you know, I probably have in my closet boxes and boxes of regular old-fashioned journals. So if you were talking to somebody like me, I'm finding my biggest challenge is learning, trying to do your bullet journal. The The notes are supposed to be succinct, and I'm used to traditional journaling. Would you talk a little bit about why you recommend these succinct notes and maybe give some advice for someone like me who's trying to learn how to do it that way? My struggle with traditional note-taking was that I spent all my time trying to get down everything. I may have been listening, but I wasn't hearing what was being said, right? I, I was just trying to write as fast as I could, which made my notes illegible and also left all these strange gaps in the notes because, at least for me, it was impossible to keep up on a technical level. So what I started to do is take less notes but focus on what was being said specifically and try to hear what was being said as opposed to just passively listening and copying everything. My solution to this was essentially creating bulleted lists, which is something that people are aware of. And these bulleted lists in the bullet journal are actually categorized into different types of notes. So we have tasks, events, yeah, tasks, events, and notes, basically, those are the three categories, and they all have a different icon to help people understand and discern between the types of notes quicker. So on the one hand, it's a to-do list or a task list or just a bulleted list that has a lot more context. And the reason why I think it's important to keep your notes short is that it forces you to pinpoint what's valuable. So rather than writing everything down, I would be listening very carefully and trying to identify what it was that actually was meaningful or valuable. And clearly this is not a perfect science as all note taking isn't, but over time it helped me listen in a different way. It's the difference between listening and hearing. So the idea of having these bullets is that they serve as mental anchors essentially. Like obviously there's a lot more information that was there but what was most important and trying to formulate the way that you take these notes in a way that will help you unpack it later on. Bullet journaling isn't about keeping your notes as short as possible. It's about being able to keep up with your mind in many ways. I find that there are a lot of things going on up there. It's easier for you to be able to just place these mental anchors in the moment. And then later on, you can begin to unpack them a little bit more or identify questions that you can then follow up on later, as opposed to trying to struggle to figure out what do I do if I don't understand this right now and all these things. So, for example, if you're listening to content, here are the three things that are really meaningful here. Here are two things that I didn't understand. And I just write that down really quickly. It just helps you continue to be, I guess, connected with the source or engaged with the source in a more direct way. In my own experience, and it seems that I'm not alone in this with my community, is a lot of people were just so stressed out by trying to write everything down that by the time they were done, they didn't learn anything. They were just so busy trying to keep up. And in this case, all of a sudden, if you're less anxious and you're less stressed, you're actually in a state where you can receive the information in a more clear way. Plus, you're thinking about it as it's being said. You have that room to actually think as opposed to spending all your energy trying to mimic the source. That's a really interesting point, and I never would have thought of it. I mean, I've had some teaching experience myself, and I've never understood because I was never a person who would have tried to write down everything that a teacher said. I guess I was just lucky. I from a young age, I've always, my note taking was, well, what's important? And I look at people and I see them writing down every little thing you say, and I'm like, why are they doing this? So it never dawned on me until hearing you say that just now that 
people feel pressured to actually do that? Yeah, well, I think it's it's one of those things, especially if you struggle in school as I did. It's hard to know what's going to be important if you struggle specifically in education. You just you feel like the only solution is to write down everything because you don't know what's going to be on the test. You don't know any, all these things, and you're so you spend so much of your time and energy focused on that story and on that narrative of like, I don't know what's important. I can't do this. I can't do all these things that like, of course you don't have the resources available to just be present and hear what's being said. And once you start changing that story, you can begin to actually hear what's being said. You can focus in a way that is a lot more engaged with the source. And that's the best way I can put it. You're not busy worrying, you're busy hearing. So getting just a little bit into a different piece of this, one of the things you say several times in your book is the importance of getting the stuff out of your head. And that reminds me of David Allen's getting things done approach, which is based on that same principle. And he did write a wonderful endorsement for you that's in the front of your book. Can you talk a little bit about that getting the things out of your head principle? Certainly. I think we live in an age where we have, I guess you could say that we're always told that we now have, through technology, we have unlimited access to information. I think it's the other way around, that information now has unlimited access to us. And when information has unlimited access to us, it also provides unlimited distractions, stress distractions. I mean, like at this point, I I don't see many people just sitting somewhere looking around. If there is some dead time, they're on their screen all the time. And that doesn't give us any opportunity to decompress, to actually think about anything. With unlimited distractions, our minds become absolutely packed I think it's not that technology is bad. I just think our relationship with technology is really bad. We have so much data that we have to contend with. And for a lot of us, we have racing minds anyway. And if there's no outlet for that, you know, it's no wonder that levels of anxiety are skyrocketing now. It's just like people are thinking so much and there's so much in their heads that I feel that there has to be some kind of mechanism to declutter your mind a little bit. Right, Because all that information is just racing around. It's not really tangible. These are all notions. The idea of actually taking those thoughts and committing them to paper is a really powerful step in slowing down your mind right? and actually taking these notions and turning them into ideas. Because in your mind, your thoughts aren't mostly are not fully formed. They're just fractions of concepts. As soon as you take it out of your mind and write it down, you actually have to articulate that thought. You take it from a notion and you evolve it into an actual idea. What are you worried about exactly? Why are you worried about that? How do you actually articulate that concern? Or here's a notion and then you write it down. Like, what's interesting about this notion? You know, this is not necessarily only about negative thoughts. It's like you take this notion and you slowly, by writing it down, It's the first step of actually evolving that notion into an idea. And in both cases, both positive and negative, like seeing your thought on paper can have a really powerful effect. One, it provides a lot more clarity, provides distance and context. When you write it out, when you actually have to articulate something, all of a sudden this thought is looking back at you. And sometimes you're like, oh, wow, that was a really silly thing to worry about. It takes the heat out of a thought, if you will. Or if something seemed interesting in your mind and it's been distracting you and you write it down, you can actually pinpoint what it is that has sparked your interest or your curiosity and develop that into a fully blown idea. By writing things out, you give your thoughts an opportunity to breathe a little bit. They're static all of a sudden. You don't have to contend with trying to keep them straight in your mind constantly, you know, and especially with all the stress that we have in our daily lives, taking it out of our head and putting it on paper can really lower the pace of life very quickly. It can lower anxiety very quickly. 
I mean, you also see this as a therapeutic device. This goes way beyond bullet journaling. But like, for example, in the treatment of OCD, a lot of times people who have these obsessive thoughts, when they start articulating them out on paper and writing them out, all of a sudden it gives them distance. It's not all consuming anymore. And the more they do it, the more space and distance they have from their thought. And then it allows your cognitive bottlenecks to kind of clear up a little bit. I'm going to break into the interview to remind you of a couple of things. As I mentioned in the introduction, you can subscribe to Books and Ideas in your favorite podcasting app. If you can't find your show in your favorite app, please let me know so I can fix it. Another option is to listen in the free Books and Ideas mobile app that's available for iOS, Google, and Windows devices. It contains the full library of Books and Ideas. Last but not least please consider leaving a review in iTunes. I appreciate that it takes extra effort to post a review, so every month I'm going to send a $10 Amazon gift card to the first 10 people who send a screenshot of their review to docartemis at gmail.com. My first exposure to the idea of bullet journals came from my niece, and she showed me this journal that was full of all this colored ink, and my response was, well, That's cool, but it looks too time-consuming. I didn't realize that the system was really very simple until I read your book. I know I sort of talked about other things first, but do you want to just give us an overview of of the system and, and why it's called a bullet journal? So the bullet journal method has two main components. It has the system and then it has the practice. So the system is what most people are familiar with. That's very visual and what you see on Pinterest and Instagram. A good way to think about the system is kind of like a Lego set, essentially, where every single piece serves a very specific purpose. And like Legos, it's also modular. So I provide the core modules, or as we call them, collections, to help people start having a framework into which they can plug in their own pieces that they design. For example, the four core collections are the daily log, which helps us unload our mind pretty much in real time every day. We have the monthly log, which helps us take a step back and clarify our priorities for the month and also have a timeline of how things unfolded throughout the month. And then we have a future log for tasks that will happen outside of the month because, again, there are no predetermined templates the bullet journal is designed to evolve organically and then we have the index and the index basically helps us locate all of our content inside the bullet journal so the system part is very basic and then we also have a technique called rapid logging which we talked about a little bit earlier which is being able to reduce and clarify our thoughts into tasks events and notes once you have the foundation down, like you are encouraged to develop your own collections. So for some people, that might be a habit tracker. For some people, that might be ways to organize medical care for somebody or class notes. Again, it's about figuring out what you need out of your bullet journal. And with this foundation and these core collections, essentially, it provides a foundation that allows other people to turn it into a tool that is custom designed for their own life. I've read one other book, I think it was called like Dot Journaling or something, just for comparison to yours. And it was a decent book, but there was no index. Would you talk about why the index is important? Because that's not usually a part of any kind of journaling I've ever seen before. So it stands out for me. I mean, for me, it was, again, another solution to a problem that I had, which is I would lose my content inside my notebooks. The way that I kept notes originally was very different from what you see now. But I would use my notebooks for everything from drawing to note taking to writing stories like anything that my mind had in it like went into the notebook and I loved having it all in one notebook and that took a lot of time to get to that place but the way I was able to do that is by creating the index which is simply a way of being able to locate 
it's the solution to losing things in your notebook. It allows you to quickly locate your content wherever it may be. And we do that through a variety of different techniques. So in the bullet journal, every time you engage with it uh, and you create a collection, you give it a title and a page number, and that title and a page number go into an index, which is basically a mashup of a traditional table of contents and an index. I like to refer to it as a table of contexts because we use it to locate our content, but we also use it to become aware of where we're investing our time and our energy. So when you look at your index, you can see what you're focusing on. So it provides multiple different tools. Also, can we talk a little bit about the idea of migration? I think one of the biggest challenges that I had with taking lists, on the one hand, I love making lists because that was very helpful to me to stay organized. But one thing that I would constantly keep failing on is that my lists would just keep growing and growing and growing and growing until they became too overwhelming. And then again, anxiety went up and productivity went down. And I found that if I had to rewrite the things that I hadn't done yet, then all of a sudden my lists would miraculously shorten all the time. So once a month, essentially what you do is you go through your previous month and you look at all the tasks that you haven't completed yet. And then you ask yourself a question, which is, does it matter to me or somebody that I love? Is it vital? Think rent, taxes, that kind of thing. Items that you'd get in trouble for if you didn't do. And then lastly, like, what would happen if this didn't get done ever? And, you know, a lot of times the answer to those very small questions can be very illuminating. And the idea is that you're not trying to get everything done. You're trying to surface the things that actually matter on an ongoing, continual basis. So if an open task does not pass that test, then you leave it behind. You cross it off. It becomes irrelevant. However, if it does pass that test, then through migration, you take it from the previous month and then you rewrite it by hand in the next month. And in that process, you start weeding out a lot of things that are simply distractions. It's a lot easier to write down a task than to actually do it, right? To think about it at the time. Migration just gives you an opportunity to take a step back and think about the things that you're allowing to become part of your experience. The way that I like to look at to-do lists is that each task is an experience waiting to be born. So our task lists, our to-do lists, are in some ways time machines that allow us to glimpse the future that we're working towards. And when you start perceiving it in that context, all of a sudden there are a lot of things on that list that you don't want to have part of your future or don't add value to that future. So then all of a sudden you realize that maybe these are things that I shouldn't be investing my time and energy into. In that process, month after month after month, the idea is that you're reducing distractions and focusing on things, yes, priorities, but you're investing your time and energy into things that add value to your life, things that you believe matter. This isn't about becoming happier or focusing on only the things that you enjoy. It's about focusing on things that you believe add value to your life, things that are actually important. And in that process, in migration, what happens is that you become a lot more engaged with these things because you've, you've decided, again, that this is still important. So your motivation stays high. A lot of the to-do lists that I had that failed or like I, there was no motivation left right? I'm not motivated to do these things. Why don't I care? Through the act of migration, we're constantly curating our to-do lists to be spending the most amount of time with the fewest things. And that's another reason for doing it by hand, because it's too easy to copy and paste when you're using a digital tool. Exactly. That friction isn't completely intentional. Like, think about it this way. If you don't have the, I don't know, five seconds it takes to rewrite something, if it doesn't add enough value for you to be able to do that, then chances are it's not really that important. Just by that simple physical act, it filters things out really quickly. Like, I don't want to rewrite this. This really isn't that important. Okay, all of a sudden you have one less thing to do. So your book is full of practical 
doable suggestions. Would you like to share one of your favorites? I think that introspection. So we have this thing called reflection, where essentially at the end of every day and at the beginning of every day, you just sit down with your list, the things that you've written either the day before or throughout the day. And you think about these things and you run it through the test that I was just talking about. I think in that process, you can gain a lot of insight. You've written down your thoughts throughout the day. And it's not just about tasks too, right? These notes can be about the way you feel about certain things or details that you want to remember. Over time, that can help you think a lot more clearly, right? It helps you prioritize things on an ongoing basis and really stay connected with the things that you're working on or surface that you are disconnected from them and figure out why. It allows, I, I guess, our continual dialogue with life to be more productive. So I, I feel like reflection, which only can take up to like five minutes in the morning and five minutes at the end of the day, helps us remain focused on the things that matter. And all you're doing is you're sitting down and you're reading what you wrote and thinking about it. That's it. That's all you're doing. On the one hand, I think it's really important to write down your thoughts, but I think it's also really important to re-engage with your thoughts later when time has gone by and maybe you have more context or you've cooled down a little bit or more information has come to light. I think that just like hoarding information in general is not the solution, right? It's about studying your experience and daily reflection helps you get into that cycle of actually questioning what it is that you're doing. Now, you're not judging yourself necessarily. You're just trying to learn from what you've experienced. And then if you make that an ongoing habit in your life, you can learn things a lot quicker, I believe, right? You know, we all learn through experience, but like when you actually really engage with your experience and study it, you can identify patterns in your own behavior or in your own work that you may not have otherwise and it allows you to make progress on an ongoing basis and allows you to avoid making the same mistakes over and over again, right? It's like, ooh, I'm starting to do this thing that I did last time. What did I do last time to correct this and change course rather than being three months into a project? You know, like on day two, you can realize, okay, this is what I'm doing now and this is what needs to happen tomorrow. So I think reflection would be one of the most important parts of this practice that has made a significant impact on my life. That's a really good point because, as I mentioned, my box full of journals that I never look at, if I ever do, I'll go back and I'll say, I'll read one and I'll say, I learned that already 10 years ago and I forgot it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's disturbing how often you seem to learn the same lesson over and over. Right. And, and I think it's because they're too spread out sometimes, right? You learn something and then it goes away. But if you're constantly re-engaging with your experience, with your learning, then you evolve. I mean, of course, you're going to forget things. It's not about being perfect. It's about making progress every day and building off the things that you learn, solidifying that foundation. But I will say, since my audience probably skews a little bit older, the idea that it helps your memory to write things down is, is a good point. You also mentioned in the book that our memories are not as reliable as we think, which is something that I talk about on my other podcast, Brain Science, a lot. So that's a, just a practical thing. But I like the idea of this reflection just for a few minutes in the morning and at night as a way to unplug, since so many people have a hard time with this whole unplugging. Yeah, it, A, it helps us unplug, and B, it helps us catch up with our lives, with our thoughts. At the beginning of the day, it helps you focus on your priorities and surface what it is that you need to do in the day. And before you go to bed at night, it helps you, A, realize that you've actually made progress today, even if you haven't felt it, because you're looking through your list of like, oh, here are these things that I got done. Here are some things that I don't want to forget for tomorrow that I hadn't written down yet. And it just helps you offload and decompress before you go to sleep. You feel like you've made progress. You don't feel like you're going to forget something while you're lying in bed. And it's just like a really nice ritual to bookend your day. Since the bullet journal method on the surface 
combines the to-do list, the planner, and journaling. Would you say that this reflection bit is one of the key things that sets it apart from these other approaches, even beyond it just being sort of a mashup? Sure. It's one of the things that sets it apart. I mean, between reflection and migration, again, there's the system and the practice. And I think the practice is really what helps set it apart. The system builds on a lot of things that we already know. Like I didn't invent bulleted lists or page numbers or things like that, but it's how these different components interact with each other and support with each other, how they've been integrated is different. So there's the data. This is how you organize the data. But what you do with that data, how you learn from that data, how you grow from that data, I think that's what sets it apart. And also that the emphasis is always on the user, right, to continue to develop the system and this practice also sets it apart. I provide different tools. It's up to the user to build with those tools and create their own tools, essentially. That's why I always say it's like do what works for you. Not do anything, but do what helps you move towards the things that matter, the things that you find to be important. And that changes over time. So there's, there's a flexibility and, and emphasis on evolution of the system that I haven't seen elsewhere. Before we close, would you like to return to the subject of mindfulness? Because you mentioned that early on, and I'd like to return to that. You sort of alluded to it as a tool for mindfulness, but would you like to talk about it more directly? And certainly. The way I like to break it apart is on the one hand, you have the system, and the system is there to help us become more productive. It helps us guide our actions. But we can be very productively working towards the wrong things, towards empty goals. This has happened to me in my career a couple of times where I've, you know, sunk years into a project, and when it's complete, it just didn't matter. I just didn't care. I didn't. And I couldn't understand why. And the reason is that I just never really thought about what was important to me. I kind of had absorbed goals from other people in my industry and in my field. And I think we're all kind of guilty of that. Be rich or, you know, get the house or the boat or all these goals, right? And that's kind of problematic. I think it's because we just absorb these goals and then these destinations from other people. So on the other hand, we have the mindfulness practice. And that's about becoming more present, right? It's about being okay with where we are and, and trying to see more clearly where we are in life right now, how we feel about things, what we want more of, what we want less of, not in a judgmental way. You're just essentially stepping out of traffic and seeing it for what it is. And in that process, right, this is exactly what meditation is for as well. There's a lot of similarities in this. In that process, you have a lot of insight. I want more of this in my life. I want less of this in my life. It helps us learn more about ourselves on an ongoing basis, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. It helps us correct the stories that we're telling ourselves a lot of the time that may be rather harmful and may not be real, I think. Tara Brock once said, you know, a lot of times our thoughts are real, but they're not true. And in mindfulness, you can start to see that distinction on an ongoing basis. And I think that's really important. In mindfulness, it allows us to be more present in the moment or and help us become less and less distracted. And once we get into the habit of doing that, again, we have these insights. But insights are also just thoughts, right? So mindfulness helps us cultivate our thoughts in a way and helps us think differently. But that also in itself isn't complete, I would say, because thoughts are forgotten. Taking these insights, taking these beliefs and putting them into action, and thereby we lead a more intentional life. So the idea is aligning your actions with your beliefs on an ongoing basis to lead a more intentional life. And that's really what the bullet journal method is. It helps us become more productive and it helps us become more mindful. It bridges that gap in many ways because when you have an insight, all of a sudden you have a mechanism that allows you to put it into play. You know, it's like, ooh, I would like less of that in my life. How can I change my behavior in my to-do list 
to reduce this or increase this or, you know, that kind of thing. Both are really important. Productivity without mindfulness is really dangerous, but mindfulness without productivity also has its problems. Ryder, what else would you like to share before we close? A lot of times when people look up bullet journaling or bullet journal, they encounter, as you mentioned earlier, very, very elaborate examples of these things. And they're like, wow, I I can't do this because I'm not an artist or I don't have the time for it. And though there's nothing wrong with the more elaborate interpretations of the system, those are the choices those people made. It's also not what is required in order to bullet journal. Like bullet journal is a very personal practice and it starts very simply. If people are curious, I would suggest that they check out the free tutorials on bulletjournal.com. When you see those examples, all it requires is pen and ink and and not a single artistic bone in your body. If you choose to make it more elaborate, that's fine. But start with the basics. Start by understanding what you want to get out of it, right? Like, what do you need it for? Why are you curious about it? And start by focusing on that and then building as you become more comfortable. That's great advice. So now that you've got your first book under your belt, what's next? What's most interesting to me is just becoming a better teacher at this, right? I'm learning an incredible amount from the community, and I'm very fortunate to have a very diverse community, all with their own different kinds of needs. A lot of people are intimidated by the blank page. Like I mentioned earlier, it's like it can become whatever you need it to be, and people or like, I don't know what I need it to be. So I'm trying to focus on different ways to help people access the methodology based on their use cases. For example, we have more and more content that's based on themes like bullet journaling for parents or bullet journaling for project managers. And I would like to explore that territory a lot more to make it valuable to as many people as I can. Well, I want to say that I think your, your book's a great start. It's much more than just a process, I mean, or I don't know, I guess I picked the wrong word, but the reason that I enjoyed it and wanted to talk to you was not the nuts and bolts, but the the whys. So thank you for spending your time with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I want to give my thanks to Ryder Carroll for coming on Books and Ideas. The reason I had him come on to talk about the bullet journal method is that I have found the method personally useful, so I wanted to share it with you. I highly recommend this book if you think you might want to give it a try. Please feel free to send me feedback at docartemis at gmail.com or leave voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash docartemis. That's D-O-C-A-R-T-E-M-I-S. You can also post to our Books and Ideas fan page on Facebook. And don't forget to send me a screenshot of your iTunes review so that you can get a $10 gift card from Amazon. I hope you will check out my other podcast, Brain Science and Grain Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back next month on the 15th. Books and Ideas is copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this show to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at docartemis at gmail.com. Theme music for Books and Ideas is The Open Door by Beatnik Turtle. Please visit their website at beatnikturtle.com.